So good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining our webinar today, featuring APA's new book, uh, Deliberate Practice in Emotion-Focused Therapy. And we are very happy today that we have the authors um, demonstrating the exercise in the book. Without further ado, that's welcome Drs. Rhonda Goldman, Alex Boss, and Tony Rosemanier. Hi, everyone. <laughs> oh, hi. So we're up. And uh, right, so we're going to talk about our new book, which we're actually very excited about. And first, we're going to talk about a little bit about deliberate practice. And then we're going to really try to show you how uh, deliberate practice is done in the context of emotion focused therapy. So I'll just say to start out that. Um, EFT, emotion-focused therapy, for those of you who might be familiar with it, has a very strong tradition of training and supervision that is really based in a very hands-on uh, approach and, and a very sort of experiential uh, supervision framework. And so that when uh, Alex and Tony approached me about writing this book, I was like, at first I was thinking, well, you know, we do that already, right? The EFT already does that. But then they explain more to me about how it all works and, and how it could be helpful. And I, now that we've actually put this all together, I've grown very fond of using this as a supplement to what I do in my training and supervision with people. And I think it's gonna make an excellent addition to the tradition. And uh, in part, it's because it's very <clears throat> hands-on and it's very experiential. And at first, I was a little bit unsure about the sort of rehearsal technique aspect of it. But in fact, what I think happens as you learn to do it is that these kind of micro skills that we, that these fundamental micro skills that we rely on as we sit with our clients in the room, um, become things that are just rote for you so that when you want to provide an empathic response, an empathic reflection or empathic conjecture, then it's kind of right there at your fingertips. So it sort of provides you with this very automatic ability to bring the skill forward in response to the client at the right moment. And with that, I am going to turn it over to Alex, who's going to talk to you about deliberate practice. Thank you, Rhonda. Hello, everyone. So first of all, we are sorry we can't see you in person because it would be mm -hmm. really nice to see all of you. But we are going to make things a little bit experiential later on. And we're going to actually practice together a little bit for you to get a taste of what we've been working on. And also know that our friend Tony and co-author is taking the helm uh, on the chat. So if you have any little practice related questions, feel free to uh, put them in the chat and Tony will take it from there. All righty. So. As Ron was saying, so we did this marriage between the little practice and emotion focused therapy. The little practice is actually a field of research that's over 30 years old at this point. And so we just want to give you a very brief overview about why this could be important for psychotherapists. And I guess the first important question is do therapists improve their effectiveness, their client outcomes over time? And the answer is a resounding, very confident, not reliably. So some therapists really do get more effective in client outcomes over time with years of experience. Others do not. They might actually deteriorate, unfortunately, and others may stall. So this is just one example of one study from our friend Simon Goldberg. Uh, who tracked the outcomes, he and his colleagues tracked the outcomes of 170 therapists up to 18 years. And what they found is that there was a huge variability in terms of the correlation between the therapist's experience, years of clinical experience, and their actual client outcomes. This is one example of many studies just to let us know that just doing the little practice, just performing it in a routine basis uh, with clients does not necessarily correlate with you getting more effective as a therapist over time, 
right? And there's an argument be made that what you do outside of the therapy session and perhaps the type of supervision, practice, whatever that you do outside of the actual work performance might be the thing that most impacts your effectiveness. So the little practice researchers are not surprised by the graph you just saw before. So, you know, for us as therapists, our common sense might be kind of feeling a little bit intimidated. Oh my God, I have 20, 30, 40 years of clinical experience. Does that at all correlate with my effectiveness? Not necessarily, it seems. And actually for deliberate practice researchers, what they found is that all of us are um, prone to fall into what's called arrested development. Arrested development is an interesting phenomena in that when we start out doing whatever it is, our profession or whatever field we're in, we usually get much more effective at it in the beginning. So we get a short burst of effectiveness in the first months or years of doing whatever we want to do. What happens as habits set in is that it's very easy to get into arrested development, meaning you basically stagnate in your performance. There's pros and cons to that. I mean, it's normal that we would stagnate and create our own kind of habits. The problem is that this uh, would lead us to never really be developing over time. And what these researchers have found is that for us to not get stuck in the rest of development, you actually have to do some things that are outside of our, let's say, comfort zone. Do put some effort in it. And there are two major kind of uh, publications here that we're referring you to. One is the Cambridge Handbook of Expertise and Expert Performance, which kind of is a summary of the main author, the man who coined the little practice, K. Anders Ericsson. And there's a layperson's version summary of this research, which is this book called Peak. So what these uh, researchers found is that there are actually some basic principles of training that the more someone does these principles systematically over time, the more likely it is that their performance will keep growing as years go by. And as Rhonda was saying, it's interesting because different therapy models have been tapping to these different principles in different ways over the years. So this little practice research, I would say, is more of an augmentation and a framework from which to think about different things we can do to structure the way we train and supervise therapists. And just to mention very quickly, the little practice in psychotherapy is a very early, it's, it, it's in its early stages of development. Okay, so it's been going on in different fields for many years now. So there's very solid research on the, the importance of the little practice in music, in sports. You can see behind me, I have a beautiful collection of guitars. So that's the field I'm also coming from. And the little practice is very well institutionalized there. In psychotherapy, not so much. So the first major article uh, study on it was in 2015. But as you can see in this table here, there's been a steady growth in interest in research in the little practice. And for you researchers out there, we really do need more research. So this is a wonderful topic to whoever wants to sink their teeth in. Okay, so very briefly, so what makes deliberate practice different? What are these principles that seem to predict the development of expertise? And we can boil it down to five basic principles. I'm not going to be comprehensive here. There are a number of publications you can go to. But very simply, first, we want to observe our work. In the case of psychotherapy, we want to, in some way, for example, audio record or video record our performance instead of just self-reporting on our performance. So, for example, if you have a supervisor or a teacher, you know, the biases of memory uh, are <laughs> hold all of us. So bringing a videotape usually is the thing that's going to be the most helpful for you to get expert feedback on. And I like to think that if you have a supervisor, you can't really self-report to a supervisor something that you yourself are not aware is happening, right? So you really need an outside eye in some sort of objective documentation of your work performance in order to get helpful feedback. So that's one. And in the EFT tradition, actually, which comes out of a client-centered tradition, you know, Rogers famously started doing audio tapes very early on, which is wonderful, and then moving to videotapes. So this is something that in some models has uh, already been kind of at the forefront of training and supervision, which is wonderful. So first, we want to actually observe work, not just self-report on our work. Then we want to get expert feedback on that observed work. 
And the expert feedback you want to get from a teacher or a supervisor is kind of specific. It's not in our case, for example, uh, talking a lot about just the client, the variables outside of the therapist, but it would actually be focused on the therapist performance, right? And it can be a very minute kind of feedback. So when you therapists say this in this way, do you notice that this happens? Can we now try it again and see if we can help you with this little aspect? And now I'm foreshadowing the third principle, which is establishing small learning goals. Now, the reason we call them small learning goals is that our field kind of loves broad <laughs> learning goals and broad topics that are very interesting for papers and research. So we talk about the therapeutic relationship, the therapy alliance, all very important constructs, of course. The problem is you can't really practice getting better at the therapeutic relationship. It's just too huge of a thing. It would be like myself wanting to become better as a pianist and saying, I'm going to practice Mozart's sonata. I mean, it's a good end goal, but we need small learning goals in between there to get there. In our case, we got to develop small learning goals that are practicable for skill building in psychotherapy, which as you're about to see is exactly what we did with this book series and with this book on EFT, is providing with small practicable chunks that you can actually practice repeatedly so you can get better at over time. And then perhaps the meat and potatoes of the lower practice is the behavior rehearsal, which is instead of just thinking about your practice, you actually have to do something. You got to put your body into it. And this is what I think makes the lower practice a very much of an experiential procedural kind of training and supervision is that you can't really get better at doing a therapy intervention by just thinking about it or reading it somewhere, or seeing someone else do it. You got to actually try it out yourself, right? And many of us have this experience of thinking, oh, I know how to do that, right? I know how to do an empathic understanding, for example. And the thing is, when you actually then try to do it, you, you stumble more than you expected. It doesn't feel as tidy as it was in your head, right? That's the beauty of actually doing the behavior rehearsal. And then as you're doing it, you're getting feedback moment by moment, on mm -hmm. what uh, that performance was and try it again and let's make it a little bit better. So the little practice is an incremental type of training, right? You're going moment by moment, trying to get a little bit better over time, which added up will hopefully get to an increased therapy performance. So the basic gist of it is trying to do this career long repetition. And the more you do it, the more likely it is that you're going to increase your capacity and your skill, clinical skills in psychotherapy. And so that leads us to our book. And I'm going to hand it back to Rhonda. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. So here are the skill. Ex so these are the 12 skills. Um, and for this book series, um, because this is the first in a book series that uh, Alex and Tony have have edited, right, or are still editing, right? Um, and and so part of what we had to do in putting the book together is to isolate and identify what are the twelve core skills of EFT, which was actually quite difficult to narrow down because there's many skills. So we came up with these twelve, and I, I just want to talk about them um rather briefly so th there the skills are divided into three categories which is uh beginner intermediate and advanced and so we actually do recommend people to go through them in a sequential format because the earlier ones are a little bit less they're a little easier and then it gets more difficult as you go up uh, overall there are two skills focused on therapist uh process, um, therapist self-awareness, number one, and then you jump to number nine, staying in contact in the face of intense affect. And that's because EFT is very focused on accessing, helping people to access emotion and deepen emotion in the process, which can provide challenges for the therapist, right? So you have to really stay in contact with the client, even when they're communicating and expressing very strong affect. And it's really about holding them in that place and sometimes helping them to deepen it. So we do have two skills that are focused on that. We also have a number of skills that are focused on the empathic responses. So some of you may know that EFT 
uh, uses a lot of different types of empathic responses, but it's really empathic responses that are designed to help people to access and deepen affect, right? So it's really about being attuned to affect. And there's various ways that we do that empathically. So there's actually five different types of empathic responses that we help people to practice through this book. And um, there's also number four, uh, sorry, five is providing treatment rationale for EFT. And again, I think all the books in the series will have a, an item on providing treatment rationale. And this was really interesting to do uh, in, in working this book up because, um, okay, one of the things that I think we haven't mentioned is how much we piloted these skills, right? So um, these skills were piloted with groups internationally um, across Asia, across Europe, across um, America. South America, North America, and, and we actually had people trying these skills and then giving us feedback about how did this work. And, and to some extent we adjusted um, based on feedback that was given. So they've really been piloted already. And it was just really interesting to get some of the feedback because what people would say about this treatment rationale is, oh, so this is what EFT is, right? So people, again, it, it kind of supports the whole notion of deliberate practice because people may be very, very aware of the theory and the principles, but then they don't know exactly how to do it and how to apply it when they get into the room. And so giving people examples of what it means to provide a treatment rationale for EFT was tend, tended to be very informative for them and very educative. So that was there. There's also um, the last skill is addressing ruptures and facilitating repair. And again, all the different books will have uh, skills on rupture and repair. So this gave us a, an opportunity to show how do we in an EFT framework actually address ruptures and facilitate repair. And it's not maybe surprising for people to hear that it's very much based on therapist self-disclosure and therapists sharing their own experiences and then refocusing back on the client, um, okay. And then the last thing I wanna say, oh, is uh, skill number 11, which is marker recognition and chair work task setup. So again, markers and tasks really uh, denote EFT. And, and that's a lot, it's a very hands-on moment by moment experiential therapy, and which is based on, and, and therapists who learn it train to be able to recognize markers and then based on markers, facilitate setup and facilitate tasks. So then when we went to write this book, it was like, okay, how are we gonna translate that into a deliberate practice format? And, and so this actually provided some challenge. And I would say that there's three different kind of core tasks that EFT uses that I was able to isolate the markers for. So that's the self-critical task and the self-interruptive task and the unfinished business task. So therapists in training can learn how to recognize markers and then facilitate chair work uh, uh, tasks set up based on those markers by practicing the skills in this book. However, this is not to say that this is comprehensive. There are many markers and tasks in EFT that we've defined in other books that we've written. And um, we have written a number of uh, books on emotion focused therapy and the, the spell out how to do that. There's the learning emotion focus therapy book that comes to mind that we're currently working on a second edition of. Um, these are all actually APA uh, published books. So um, I encourage people to look elsewhere and that this is viewed as supplementary and that to say also that the skills are not necessarily comprehensive in the sense it doesn't describe everything that the EFT therapist does, but again, the core skills. And you know, in terms of tasks, markers and tasks, um, it's got some of them, but then they're really sort of moment by moment operations of what you do when you're facilitating a task, I think we'll have to go into the next edition of EFT, uh, deliberate practice for EFT, <laughs> right? So um, I think that kind of covers what we want to do. So now, I guess, Alex, I'm going to give it back to you because you're controlling the slides and we're going to show you, yeah, go ahead and in advance. Yeah. So we're going to show you a little demonstration video that we made. And this is with two of my students 
And I think it really demonstrates and shows us how EFT, uh, deliberate practice in EFT is done. So yeah. whenever you're ready, Alex, roll it. Thank you. I, I, I will just say something very quickly. Yeah. Which one of the things I'm most happy and proud of, I wish as an undergrad I had had this, is these books actually forced the offers to come up with 15 client statements and 15 example responses for each exercise. So it's kind of an encyclopedia where you can see the exact words that the expert therapist, in this case, Rhonda, how they would respond to many different clinical scenarios using the same skill. So it's just a wonderful way to kind of get the skill, really good understanding of the particular skill. Okay, and now <laughs> we're gonna show you the video. So, Today, um, Megan Ansley and Zoe Goldstein are going to help us to demonstrate how you do deliberate practice in emotion focused therapy. And we're going to zero in on one particular skill, which is the empathic affirmation and validation skill. So, the empathic affirmation and validation skill is one where the therapist offers the client a high degree of affirmation and validation as it sounds, and basically communicates through their words that this is very understandable and that the therapist is there to support the client in this moment. And this is what we would do um, if we were doing this deliberate practice is we'd make sure to highlight the skill criteria. So let me just say what they are. So first of all, therapist responses capture the depth and intensity of present experiencing of client. Therapist responses deepen and affirm, but do not speculate or push beyond client current experiencing, which is different than some of the other empathic responses. And therapist makes sure to use a soft, gentle, but affirming voice. So now, we're going to have, uh, Zoe's going to play the client and she's going to offer a prompt or a statement as a client might. And uh, Megan is going to demonstrate offering an empathic affirmation. Okay. So when you guys are ready, I think you have the prompt. So go ahead, Zoe, you start. I just can't believe the direction our country is taking right now. Watching the news makes me so angry. Yeah, it sounds like it's really upsetting for you. Everything that's happening right now, it's really upsetting for you. Okay, great. Um, all right, so I'm gonna actually ask you to just do that, try it again. Same thing, try it again. And, and Megan, you can, um, you can improvise as you see fit, right? Okay. So. <clears throat> I just can't believe the direction our country is taking right now. Watching the news makes me so angry. Yeah, I hear that you're, you're feeling really angry and there's just so much that's happening for you right now. Okay. All right. Good. How did that feel, Megan? How did that feel for you? I feel like the second time I understood a bit more that that feeling of anger, I think mm -hmm. seeing it again and like kind of channeling into that piece of that upsetness for Zoe um, mm -hmm. helped doing it the second time. Okay. So you feel like you were able to sort of almost like be more present the second time with what, with the emotional tone behind yes. what she was saying? Yes, yeah. I would say so. Okay, mm -hmm. yeah, because I agree. I mean, I think this the first time um, was a little bit more kind of rote and, and mm -hmm. then like the second time had more of you behind it, more of your yeah. your, your presence and your voice um, softened a little bit and okay. slowed down a little bit too. So, so that's really good. All right, so let's try uh, another one, a, another client prompt. I accidentally hit a pedestrian while driving the other day. The weather was bad and the sun was in my eyes so I couldn't see him and he was taken to the hospital with broken bones and I feel so guilty. It sounds like it was really hard for you. It sounds like there was a lot going on. Now you're having all these feelings, um, all these things that happened to you. Okay, great. 
Okay, take a breath. <laughs> and um, and actually just, if you don't mind, do the same thing again. So you play quiet, Megan, you're the therapist. So I accidentally hit a pedestrian while driving the other day and the weather was bad and the sun was in my eyes so I just couldn't see him and he was taken to the hospital with broken bones and I feel so guilty. Yeah, I'm picking up on this sense of this sense of guilt, and it seems like things were kind of out of control for you in that moment. Okay. So, okay, again, so let, let me ask you, Megan, how how does it feel? How did how do you feel between the first and the second time? Yeah, I definitely felt like as you were saying in the first one, more present with mm -hmm. with kind of that emotion that Zoe was presenting, um, and feeling that sense of like. It seemed really uh, overwhelming for her in that moment with the guilt. So I think mm -hmm. I could I could attune to that a bit more. Okay, the second time around, you mean? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. And I think even the first time around, um, I, I feel like you were more present, right? And mm -hmm. yeah, and I think like I experienced you also, and in, in the last couple of responses. Um, I've experienced you, Megan, as like very present and very attentive. Um, and then it's just a matter of may you, maybe softening your voice a little bit. Okay. Um, and, and that's okay. Um, so thank you so much. It's really valuable to have you actually try it and demonstrate it and show us how it's done. So, yeah. and you did a great job, both of you. Hmm. Ron, you want to comment on something? Um, I think that's a good demonstration of, of how I might go about it. Um, I, when I watch it, I even think, oh, I could have given more feedback, right? Like a, more about their voice, more about, I mean, I think I did a good job of uh, both positive and sort of how you can improve feedback. But yeah, I mean, this is a real opportunity to be very experiential as a supervisor in in supervision, right? Um, and and therapists, I, I was also, I remember also even during the video, um, you know, because I know Megan and she's one of my students and and being, you know, surprised even at how receptive she was to the feedback. And, and you know, she really was able to take it in and, and integrate it. And so I feel like it could, I, I could have even done more um, kind of experiential feedback. So I, I love this, this format because it gives you this opportunity to do it in a very moment by moment way. Yeah, I agree. I like how you balance between asking how it was for her. So her internal uh -huh. experience of doing it and just opposing also with the kind of technical aspect of it, having those mm -hmm. two prioritized. And I think we'll go, we'll go back to that as we show people how we try to assess difficulty in the exercises as well. Yeah, that's a good point, Alex. I just want to emphasize it that this thing of asking her first, how was it for you? And, and what was your experience of it? And I would encourage people to do that when they're working with their supervisees. If they can first reflect on their own experience and, and then they're also much more receptive to feedback from you. So I think it's, it's a great format. So good point, thanks for bringing it up. Yeah, just before more, I'll, I'll I'll just say that it's it's interesting we found repeatedly because now we're up to 160 tests of these exercises across the book uh -huh. series, and one very recurring feedback we get is people saying that they learned something about themselves while doing the rehearsal, yeah. which is kind of a byproduct product we weren't expecting initially. But as people are really trying to improvise, find their own style in doing these skills, they found out things about themselves, things they didn't realize. Oh, I'm not so comfortable going to this place or uh, attending to this emotion, et cetera. So it's an interesting kind of self-exploration without that being the main purpose of it. Um, can I just add one thing here? Cause I'm, I'm also responding to some questions in the chat that I'm seeing. And I'm actually seeing a question from Naya Pride, who, hi Naya, um, which is if we think about the idea of focusing on the leading edge in EFT, can this be incorporated by the supervisor? So one of the things about this book is it really lays out the skills and what, what it doesn't do as much of is it doesn't say, okay, in response to this, you want to do that, right? So the kind of perceptual skills that we also train 
And, and I, I want to emphasize that this is one aspect of training in EFT, right? It's a very important one. I think it can be a huge addition, but it's one aspect, right? And we do a lot of experiential training in EFT. Um, and part of our training is we do, we ask therapists to play therapist with the other trainee who they're working with sitting across and who's using their own real experience. I also saw another question in the chat earlier about, can you learn to do this um, by being the client? And I saw Tony that you responded and said, well, not deliberate practice, but, and that's true, right? But, but in, in training, in training EFT therapists, we do include a component that asks therapists to play themselves being real clients. And then we ask the other therapists to take turns to be their therapist, right? So you, it's very hands-on, it's very experiential. And in terms of going back to like training these perceptual skills, this is where you learn how to do it, right? And when to do it. And the other question about like how and when or going back to that is in the book, there's also a sample transcript where I show here's where I would use an empathic reflection. Here's where I would use an empathic conjecture. And we encourage people to, at the end of all of this, put it all together and actually practice using it uh, with a real client on an ongoing moment by moment basis. So just wanted to try to address some of the things people are uh, coming up with here. Wonderful. So Alex, go ahead when you're ready. Yeah, cool. So I'm just going to set the, uh, set up here a little practice for us. So we promised to make things not just didactical. We're going to make it a bit more experiential even for ourselves. So for our lovely, lovely attendees, we're actually going to provide a, a little opportunity for practice if you're up for it. So these are the skill criteria for the exercise you just saw uh, Rhonda's trainees doing, the empathic affirmation validation. I'll emphasize that skill criteria, what that means, those are the observable, verbal, and nonverbal therapist behaviors that define the skill, right? So these three skill criteria that Rhonda wrote really define a good empathic affirmation validation. And it's the kind of thing that you want to try to get across in order to do an empathic affirmation validation. So I'm going to read these out loud again. And what we're going to do is we're going to show you a client clip. So a very small clip of a client presenting a clinical situation. And we want you to put on your best empathic face and actually try out speaking to the screen as if you are with this client right now. And try out to actually respond to this client with an empathic affirmation or validation, right? So your task is at the end of the client clip that we're about to show you, to try to capture the depth and intensity of the present client's experiencing, that your response deepens and affirms but does not speculate or push beyond the client's current experiencing, and that you try to use a soft, gentle, but affirming tone. Okay. Unfortunately, we're not going to give you one-on-one -on -one coaching at this point, but still it might be very worthwhile for you to just try it out uh, by yourselves. So let's jump into the clip. And once the clip stops moving, try responding to this client uh, with an empathic affirmation validation. My daughter recently left for college. And my husband died last year. I'm all alone at home. I really feel sad and lonely. Try intervening now. Okay, I think we can yep. keep moving, right? Yep. So, so we're just hoping that people tried it at home in response to the video. And this is uh, something that we, uh, I think that you've developed, uh, Alex, uh, to be able to actually play real client. I mean, this is an actor, but still to play clips of a, as if it's a therapy. And then you can actually try and respond. And then it's great if you can get a, a supervisor to help you out and to provide you with some feedback. And you see how 
we do it in the video. So usually we do ask people to do it more than once. And the first time, sometimes it feels a little awkward, but the second time they're able to usually kick it in. And, um, and then we, I, I always wait till after the second time to give feedback, after the second time that they rehearse the response um, so that they can just get comfortable with it. And then we go into feedback. And again, I ask them to give themselves feedback first and then I say what I thought, but really keeping the criteria in mind for each of the skills. Right. And the feedback you'd be getting would be based also on these criteria. Mm -hmm. Right. Great. We're not going to do a lot of repetitions here, but don't worry because those some of these clips are available. We'll tell you later where you can practice this by yourself. So very briefly, I want to just present you just with one last step that we use in the little practice, and that's the difficulty assessment and adjustment. So the little practice, in my perspective, is a very unshaming kind of training because it doesn't really tell you that you should already be able to do this or that. It actually puts the, the pressure, let's say, on the trainer or supervisor to adapt the practice to you, to wherever you are at. So the sweet spot of the little practice is you practicing something that feels challenging, but not overwhelming. You can call it the zone of proximal development, right? So we have in the book, this is the little practice reaction form. It's a form to assess how difficult the practice you're doing is currently. And it's something that uh, is in the book uh, included. And throughout your practices, you'd be using the reaction form to be tailoring the practice to wherever you are at. So if you were to say that um, the exercise you're doing right now feels too easy, the book shows you ways to make it harder so that you can practice at a more challenging level. But let's imagine that you say that the exercise is actually too hard. So the book tells you how to make it easier. The purpose is to always try to be training at a good enough level of challenge that doesn't feel either too easy or too hard because that's where you're actually going to get systematically better over time. And this is a very important part of the little practice. And it might sound like something you can skip over, but I'm going to emphasize it would be best for you to not skip over this step uh, because you're just going to be more likely to benefit from practice in general. Ron, I'm not sure if you want to add something there. Yeah, no, I think I just want to add that, that I find this a really interesting process um, because it brings the trainee or the student's awareness to their process, right? So, so oftentimes when, when trainees are in training, they're not so focused on their own experience, their bodily felt tension, their size, their, their you know, and, and this introduces the idea that, oh, it's really important to focus on and gain awareness of your own uh, self-experience when you're actually giving the responses and I think that helps them to train right um, and and so I just I really like this as an awareness process which fits very much within an EFT framework yeah so and to to round this point you're going to see that there are two questions in the reaction form and one is a more technical question which is how challenging mm -hmm. to fulfill the skill criteria and then there's a more intrapersonal question just to promote awareness of your own inner experience and both yeah. are important we take yeah. both into account right? yes yes and the, the question of how challenging was it but was it for you it has to do it gives the trainee i think a sense of agency over this process, right? So it's like, oh, I can make it easier for myself or I can challenge myself more and it's it's my process and, and I'm in control of that. And I think that's really helpful for trainees as well. Um, so that's another important point. So the book goes in depth about all of these things, about how to tailor uh, difficulty, how to use these forms. So you don't have to memorize anything right now. You can just get the book <laughs> and it'll think everything will be very clear. I'm going to suggest mm -hmm. Laura, that we skip over this exercise just for mm -hmm. time. Is that okay? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, so one last thing as we're reaching kind of the end and going back to Rhonda's previous point, we want to emphasize that the little practice is at its best an augmentation of the great tools we already have in the field of psychotherapy training and supervision. So the idea is not to use these tools of practice to substitute what we already do that's very helpful, but actually to complement it. Things as, such as your own therapy, uh, self-care, the training, the supervision one-on-one, -on -one, and these little practice tools hopefully will be integrated in a way that will maximize your skill development. All right. 
Go ahead, Ron. <laughs> you wanna uh, no, I was just trying to respond to some of the questions. I started looking through the yeah. chat and looking at the questions. And, and so there's a question from Juan Pablo. Hi, Juan Pablo. <laughs> it's mm -hmm. fun to imagine people out there. Um, about what's the difference between training and supervision. And yeah, so I think this is more fitting in a training context. And that supervision involves, in EFT supervision, involves uh, people, act, trainees actually bringing their tapes to us. It's always done with, with real tapes, just like in the Rogerian tradition that Alex mentioned at the beginning. We followed through with that. Um, and having people bring those tapes to us. And then we do this kind of moment by moment process supervision of stopping the tape and listening and saying, okay, so what did you hear the client saying there? And then you might even say, okay, and what kind of response would you have wanted to make? And then people have this sort of understanding of these different responses and what they could have said. And then I might actually ask people to make and a response that they would have wanted to make in retrospect. So I think this does, uh, it's, it all fits together, but thank you for the question of uh, trading and supervision. And that fits in with uh, the slide that Alex has up here too. We wanna redirect you that, so Rhonda, maybe you, you wanna speak to this. Yeah, I'll say. So yeah, we just wanna tell you about the uh, International Society of Emotional Focus Therapy of which I am, uh, founding board member and my contact information is down there. We also run trainings internationally and uh, people can write to me directly if they want to get more information. Um, and I also have a website that I want to direct people to. So there, that's there. And then Alex, you want to yeah, go to the next? Yeah, just to let you know, the Delivery Practice Institute was formed some years ago already by myself and Tony, and now at the helm are the wonderful Elizabeth Rosen and Vidar Husby. And so it's dp4therapists.com. And the only like main reason connected with this uh, webinar is that if you see uh, up there, there's a tab called videos. Actually, this website is an open source resources website where there's a ton of free stuff that every therapist here can use or trainee can use and so there are a lot of the client videos that the one you, we just showed you for example that you can practice we have a lot of client videos in this website free of access that you can use for your own practice so we just hope that you have fun and use these tools and try them out and importantly for the teachers and researchers out there try researching on them. Because again, there's a lot of things for us still to discover on how to do the little practice more effectively. Yeah. Great, I think I'm gonna turn it over to Shi. Yes, um, so we have about, um, so very quickly, I just wanna share some uh, information to people who are interested in ordering the book. Um, so this book is available anywhere books are sold. But if you order the book at apa.org slash books, um, you can use the promo code for a limited time. You can use that code and save 25% for your purchase. And if you would like to um, sign up for um, APA books email alerts to receive uh, news on this book series, um, I know you guys are more, uh, working on more books in the, in the deliberate practice series. So if you want to learn more about that, you can sign up for the email alerts here. Um, um, and, and today I see that maybe we have some teachers, instructors here. If you would like to use this book for teaching the course, you can email um, this email address, um, contact us, and then we will um, help you to get a review copy or even a desk copy if you already decided to adopt this book. Um, we still have about two minutes, and I don't know if, uh, uh, if Tony or if Alex and, and Rhonda, if you guys wanna take the time to answer some questions, uh, I'll give it back to you. Just quick thing that thinking about desk copies, because some people have actually asked me for desk copies as well. So I'm glad you brought that up to you. Um, there's a sample syllabus in the book and it, this could be really helpful for designing a course. And it's designed as a whole course, but then of course you can pick and choose parts that you may want to integrate into a, another course that you're teaching. So um, that's also in the book and that, that resource is available online, right, Tony? Maybe you wanna. Yes. Yeah, so the, the link I've provided in the chat will go to a, a sample, which includes the sample syllabus, uh, which Rhonda designed. 
And uh, it's appropriate for first year graduate students. And uh, many of the exercises in the book, correct me if I'm wrong, Rhonda, are also appropriate for first year graduate students. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, definitely. definitely. And I would like to add that um, I know today we have some questions about the slides today. Um, thank you again, um, authors. Uh, thank you for your presentation. So I will try to include a lot of information that people ask today um, in the follow up email directly from Zoom. So. Um, so participants, um, um, just be on the lookout you know, for an email from Zoom. We will try to pro provide that information in that email. Okay. Great. Great. Yeah. I'd like to say thank you to everyone for the questions in the chat. We've had some really good questions. Yeah, it's been great to see the questions and I've, I've tried to answer some of them and I also didn't answer some of them. So feel free to reach out directly. Uh, Yes. Yes. And um, so right now it's um, 2.45 and we do want to end on time. And thank mm -hmm. you again, um, Tony, um, Alex, and Rhonda. Thank you for your presentation. And everyone who's online, thank you for joining us today. And um, as I said earlier, we will share um, their contact information in the, in the slide. And so if you have more questions, you're welcome to follow up. Um, all right. So uh, we're going to end the webinar here. Thank you for joining today. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye.